If you are anything like me, you miss Liz Wheeler. I do. I have missed my friend Liz Wheeler lo these many months. And I, you know, I actually got to see her, I don't know, not, not that long ago. You probably have not seen her in quite a while. Where has she gone? Was she abducted by the UFOs that we're told are soaring through our skies? We have the answers right now. Liz Wheeler joining the show. Liz, thank you for being here. Michael, thank you so much. It wasn't the UFOs, actually. It was a combined effort from the woke CIA and the Russian intelligence service that got me. Uh, I want to get into them. I want to get into them a little bit later because you I guess you have some serious insight here and I I'm really scarred having watched those recent commercials. But you were you were hosting a TV show, the bell of the ball, the talk of the town. You were everywhere in public. Anywhere I would go, I would see you. And then you disappeared. What happened? Well, as you know, I was hosting a TV show and I then had a baby. It's actually, so our babies, by the way, I believe were born two days apart, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, two days <laughs> apart, right. our babies were born. They're now betrothed, I think. They are. A uh, little they arranged the- marriage between our children. See, yeah, this is the difference. So I stopped to have a baby, gave birth. My body's amazing. Um, this, my new show, which I think we're going to talk about, has been in the works the whole time. So behind the scenes during pregnancy, and I took a, a brief eight-hour break during labor and delivery to stop planning the new show. Uh-huh. Uh, but it's been okay. in the works since... For over a year now, it's been in the works. We're really, really excited to get it going. Liz, can I confirm this phrase, my body is amazing? Is that the tagline of the show? The Liz Wheeler show, (laughs) my body is amazing. Because that was going to be my tagline. It better not be. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's, but it it actually is amazing. You were hosting the show. You were quite pregnant while you were hosting the TV show. Eventually, you know, it's time to get ready, have the kid spend a little bit of time with your kid, you know, and now you're, you're moving into this great new venture. I have long thought that you should go digital. I've long thought that you, you know, you would be just great manning a, a podcast. You're terrific on research. You're terrific on opinion. And if I, if I repeat your line, if I say your body's amazing, then I'm going to get in trouble with my wife. So I'm going to leave that aside for the moment. But seriously, this has been a long time in the making and the show is just out. Yes. Yes. This is what I've wanted to do for a really long time. And it's sort of the natural next step, right? It's the natural next step because the conservative movement as a whole is craving bold leadership. You know, the last the last four, five, six years have shown us that. And it's not just bold leadership in politics. They crave bold leadership in their thought leaders, in their news, in their media, in their opinion, in their research. They want somebody who isn't going to back down to corporate wokeism or cultural Marxism or teachers unions or AOC or big tech or leftists in Congress or mask mandates, what have you. And that's what we're going to do on The Liz Wheeler Show, right? It's a more personal connection than I've ever had before with my audience, which is great. I've been wanting to do that for a really long time. It's a more personal connection. We are going to provide my sort of trademark research, deep dive into all these topics, uh, make sure that the facts are in order, and then draw conclusions from the facts, meaning offer my opinion on what we should do based on the reality. That's the other part of my show that I think is really important and different than anybody else's. We're sort of in this era that we're beyond the question of is this true and is this false? We're beyond um, an argument about whether someone's lying or whether someone's being honest. We are now in a point where we're defending reality, where we have to be champions of reality because what the left is offering us isn't just lies, it isn't just ignorance, it's outright delusion. So on the Liz Wheeler show, we're going to do it all. It's a more personal connection. We're going to provide the research. We're going to hold politicians accountable. We are going to play offense in this culture war because politics is downstream of culture. If we lose the culture, don't even bother playing politics, right? And it, I mean, it's going to be great. I'm so excited. So this point you've hit on is very important. The the reality issue because yes. Uh, obviously two different sides in a body politic and they can have different visions of where to go. And, and, and to some degree, people are always going to be interpreting the world in perhaps slightly different ways. They're going to see things from a different angle. But what we're seeing now from the modern left is a little more than that. It's not just, well, you see it this way and I see it that way. It is, 
you see it this way and I deny objective truth. And you see it this way and I think that actually reality can just be constructed by whatever words that I use or fantasies that I have. And I, I don't think I'm strawmanning the argument here. I think that is the explicit claim uh, of many of the leftist ideologies that developed in the 20th century. So how are we supposed to fight that? If we fight that with facts and logic, they're going to say, who cares about your facts and logic? Well, it's actually worse than that. It's not just a matter of this is objective truth, which is reality, and the left wants to deny that reality. They then want to force you to abandon reality and force you to echo their delusion. So we're even a step further than just, okay, you want to pretend you're Santa Claus, like, go for it. You can deny reality. No one cares what you're doing. It's when they try to impose that on us. But, I mean, conservatives in general have a good fighting spirit, right? We're happy warriors. However, we are conservatives. The name conservative implies that we are trying to conserve something, that we are playing defense. And I think that that, in general, has been a tactical error against this against this adversary, and this adversary mm. being the radical left. We've played defense for so long. So since the 1960s, you know, we've lost control of many of the institutions that form the backbone of our moral society, right? Whether it's the family, whether it's traditional marriage, whether it's the public school system, whether it's Hollywood, movies, books, entertainment, music, we have surrendered these institutions to the left because we haven't played offense. We've tried to play defense and we've ended up sort of defending the one yard line and acquiescing inch by inch until, you know, we topple over into the into the other team's uh, end zone here. And we can't be playing like that anymore. We have to be actively fighting back. We have to yeah. identify these dangerous things, this ideology that the left is trying to impose on us through our culture, through our schools, through our government. And we have to deconstruct that and reclaim our country. You know, I totally agree, and the fact that we've lost the institutions, notably the universities, is really awful. What drives me crazy, though, with these conservatives is they will, they'll, out of one side of their mouth, they'll say, we've lost to the radical neo-Marxists, they've taken over, they're poisoning our children's minds. And then out of the other side of their mouth, they'll say, and because of academic freedom, we can never kick them out of the schools. And you say, you say, wait, hold on, wait, what, what did you, well, these guys, they're spreading lies, they're undermining our students' understanding of reason and truth, but because of freedom of speech, we can never tell them that they shouldn't say that. And you say, well, guys, are you serious or not? Are you actually, are you going to go in there and boot out the wackos? I'm thinking of Nicole Hannah-Jones, this 1619 Project fabulist. She's not a journalist, she's a fabulist who, whose central th- thesis was was wrong. It was based on a lie. She, and she doesn't admitted have a, it was wrong. And she, she admitted it was wrong. The Times yeah. admitted it was wrong. She doesn't have a PhD, she, which is, you know, if you're going to get a tenure track job, I'm not one for credentialism, but people have PhDs if you get tenure track. She's denied this. And there, there have actually been some squishes on the right co- coming to her defense and saying this woman should have yeah. been at UNC. W- w- with fighters like that, you know, who needs leftists? Well, right. I mean, that, that's that's part of what we're going to do on the show is, I mean, not only do we not have room for squishes and radical leftists and cultural Marxists, we don't have room for squish Republicans either. You know, if you don't have that fire in your belly to not just stand and defend verbally what you believe, but actually identify the threats to our cultural institutions and say, okay, if you're going to violate our freedom, we're going to vote you out. If you're going yeah. to stifle a student's free speech, we're going to, you know, levy a campaign to make sure you're not the president of the university anymore. If you're not ready to go on offense, then, you know, it's fine. Some people just don't have that in them. I'm not trying to say that everyone has to be on the be a culture warrior on the forefront of each one of these battlefronts. But if you don't, just have the humility to admit that and step aside and let those of us who do have that fire in our belly fight this fight. Because, I mean, Michael, this is what you and I do. Yeah, I certainly think so. I mean, you know, look, I, I want to say in all humility for anyone who's in politics or media, that it's not the same thing as going out and taking bullets. You know, it's not the same thing as going out and fighting literal wars. However, I just watched what you alluded to at the beginning. I just watched an ad from the CIA. CIA was this woman. She says, I'm a intersectional, Latina, proud, feminist woman. I said, what the hell? This is what James Bond became. And then I saw there was an ad for the army. And the army ad, it was this woman who says, you know, I was raised at the pride parades of my lesbian mothers. And that's how I'm going to fight the wars. And I think, what? you know, Putin, are you just 
Are you, are you listening? Or are you just going to invade now? Or are you going to c- come right across the Bering Strait or something? And then actually it was juxtaposed with an, an ad from the Russian army. And it was these macho men like, da, 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 and they're all <laughs> holding guns and firing. And I, I think, uh, do they know what the purpose of a, of a military is? Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Putin's not laughing at that CIA ad. I'm pretty sure Putin wrote that CIA ad. <laughs> Because if I were our adversaries, I mean, if I were Putin, I would give his whole intelligence community the day off because they're not going to yeah. need to come. They're not going to need to come fully prepared to defeat that kind of CIA. Well, I, you know, I, I was wondering with the I mean, you're, you're probably right. It's all it's all a big op from, you know, the Kremlin or something or uh, China. But assuming that, look, we, we can laugh at these ads. These ads are really terrible. And it's it, yeah. This makes you feel sort of ashamed that this is where we're putting our priorities and our resources here in promoting and our woke tax ideology money. and our tenor tax dollars. Uh, but you know, some of the brass in the military, some of the top dogs in the CIA, they approved this stuff. They think that this is going to serve America's national security interests. They might have perverse views of it, but what is what is the thought process here? I mean, what what on earth would possess? our our military to, to put out this image to the world. Well, I think we've heard that. If you listen very closely to what these radical leftists that Joe Biden has surrounded himself with are saying, they don't define words with reality anymore. They define words with delusion. So you and I think national security interests, and we think, okay, well, we want to make sure that our life, liberty, and our ability to pursue happiness is secured. We want to make sure that physically we're safe. We want to make sure our adversaries are at bay, et cetera, et cetera. No, they, they look at our country and they say, racism is a public health crisis. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. okay, okay, racism is a public health crisis. So, uh, first of all, it, it's it can be argued, and I would argue that racism is not is not institutional. We actually don't have systemic racism in our nation anymore. We yeah. have advanced beyond that. We have f- fought that. We have defeated it. Sure, there's instances of individual racism, which should always be condemned. But and, and institutionally, Liz, there there is in, there is institutional racism in the form of affirmative action, right? That's a that's a a law in this country through institutions that says yeah that Asian and white students are at a disadvantage and black and Hispanic students are at an advantage. That's that's not what they're talking about, though. No, that's not what they're talking about. That's not what they're talking about. Although although that is true when it comes to Asian American students trying to get into uh, the Ivy League schools, especially your alma mater, I believe. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But uh, no, I mean, it's it's completely nuts when they redefine these things. So now we're talking about a public health uh, emergency and they're saying racism is a public health emergency or climate change is a national security threat. I mean, they are yeah. trying to erase reality and replace it with their delusion. Delusion, And we, again, we can't just say, oh, you're nutty and laugh at them. We should yeah. because they're eminently ridiculous, of course. We should laugh at them, but we should also identify, well, who exactly is approving this? Is this something that's coming from the White House? Is this something that's coming from a certain, you know, administrative agency? Is this something that's approved on what level of the military or where in the CIA? We should identify where this is coming so that the people, the American people, this isn't even a a split along party lines. This is not a Republican versus a Democrat issue. This is a thinking person versus a nutty person viewpoint. Most of our country uh, think that this woke crap, excuse my French, is garbage. Most people, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, they still think that there are only two genders. They still think that the CIA and the military should be fighting forces, not cisgender, intersectional, feminist, Black Lives Matter t-shirt wearing, you know, nut jobs, right? So, I mean, it's a matter of saying, okay, this is reality, please join us on this side, and let's make sure that those who are perpetuating delusion don't have the power to do so anymore. But why is it, I I agree with all that, why is it that the institutions, you know, not just some blue haired lunatic on some, you know, middle tier college campus, but the actual corporations, the bureaucracy, the administrative government, the whatever, why are they adopting? What, what, what is the interest of Coca-Cola or Delta in adopting the crazy woke ideology of some stoner freshman at, at Wesleyan? Well, Delta, I think it's obvious, right? Weren't they getting tax breaks? And weren't there tax breaks? Weren't they getting special treatment via crony capitalism? And wasn't that threatened given the current administration? I mean, 
it, it sometimes those who run these corporations are just individually woke, right? Sometimes their workforce is woke and their workforce puts pressure on them. Sometimes, and this I believe, I would speculate, is more often the case, sometimes they have political interests that are benefiting their business that are threatened if they don't count out to what the politicians who have control over those benefits want, right? And like I said, Delta is a perfect example of that. They didn't want to lose their tax breaks, so they... So they decided to go woke. I don't know if that's going to help their business or not. In the case of Nike, I believe it did help their business. Yeah. Um, Delta, I hope it doesn't. Yeah, I, I certainly hope it does. Or woke a cola or any of, any of the other ones. It, <laughs> it's just so strange because uh, the other day it, uh, some wacko uh, posted and said that the American university is a right-wing institution. And in a sense, you know, I think of myself as a conservative. So I want to, I, I, I'm not... In inherently opposed to institutions or, you know, obviously not to traditions and rituals, but it just seems like all the power centers in the country, it's, you know, big business. How, how, for how long did Republicans shill for big business? Uh, but they're opposed to what we want to do. The, the CIA, gosh, how long did the Republicans defend the CIA? The CIA seems as leftist as, as it gets now. The FBI seems to have been infiltrated as well. So it, <laughs> to what degree are we conservatives actually trying not to conserve what's going on right now? Are we trying to actually change things? Right. Well, this is, this is a good point. And we talk about this on episodes of my show this week. We talk about the administrative state because Donald Trump famously came to Washington, D.C. promising to drain the swamp, right? That was a message that appealed across the, across the political aisle. Republicans and Democrats wanted politicians who'd been in office for too long, who were slimy and dishonest and just benefiting themselves, to be fired, to be kicked out of Washington, D.C., to no longer be in power. Donald yeah. Trump promised to do that, and he promised to do that in good faith, and he did his best to a certain extent. Yeah. The problem is, it's not something that one person, no matter if they're the president of the United States, can get rid of. And you have to look at why. You have to travel back in history and say, well, where did we get this idea of these bloated administrative agencies packed with powerful bureaucrats who are among the highest paid bureaucrats in the entire federal government, meaning Anthony Fauci is paid more than the president of the United States. He's the highest paid federal employee out of all 4 million federal employees. No <laughs> oh joke. Gosh. You can look this research up yourself. We well, have to ask depressing. ourselves, where did this come from? And the answer is twofold. First of all, it came from a Congress who allowed, who legislated their own power away from them. They don't want to take responsibility for making rules. So they pass these vague laws and leave it, leave the rulemaking, meaning defining the vagueness in the legislation that Congress passes, they leave that. They defer to these administrative agencies who then have this power that should be conserved just for the legislature. Right? So that's the first thing. Congress is cowardly. They don't want to take a stance on anything. And so they defer to federal agencies. The second thing is we allowed throughout the last hundred years, you know, from Woodrow Wilson to LBJ to FDR, we allowed the federal government to become this bloated apparatus. We allowed Supreme Court precedents that didn't defer to administrative agencies to now defer to administrative agencies. And so to get rid of this in order to actually drain the swamp, we have to undo the damage that has been done in the last hundred years. That's not playing defense, Michael. That's playing offense. Republicans must go on offense and actively unravel and unwind so that we can recover and reclaim that which made our idea of limited government great. I love it. You know, you, you brought up this great point, too, of, of how a lot of these issues are not exactly Republican versus Democrat, left versus right. There seems to be this, just this ruling class. There's like the ruling class party. And then there are the people who are not exactly the ruling class. And you see, you see it play out in the, the divide between, say, Liz Cheney and the Republicans, you know, Liz Cheney <laughs> seemed, and I, look, a lot of her voting record was fairly conservative, but really when it counted on important political issues, she would side with the liberal ruling class. And then even more offensively, she would spend a lot of her time just attacking Republicans. And where would she attack Republicans? In the dominant ruling class newspapers, in the Washington Post, on the mainstream news networks, at CNN, wherever. Uh, uh, now, now, obviously, Republicans booted Liz Cheney out, finally. It took them long enough. But if the Republicans can't even get their house in order, if the conservatives don't even control the Republican Party, the one putatively conservative party in the country, then what hope is there for us? 
Well, that's the thing. I mean, these Republicans who are establishment Republicans, the ones that I would call squishes, you know, whether it be Mitt Romney, whether it be Liz Cheney, I mean, I, I don't know if they just don't understand that the popular kids in the mainstream media don't actually like them. They're just using them as pawns. They don't actually want to be your friend. They don't actually respect your viewpoint. The mainstream media and the leftists that control the mainstream media just like to purport the narrative that the Republican Party is fractured, right? And we're always, Michael, the Republican Party is always going to have more individual thought than the Democratic Party. Party. We're, nev we're never going to walk in lockstep the way the Democrats do, because the idea of limited government, the idea of individual liberties and freedoms is to allow people to think differently, to allow people to live differently. We, I mean, it's essentially the party of independent thought. So you're going to have free thinkers who are courageous enough to contradict, you know, the people that are leading the party. That's always going to happen. It's not even necessarily a bad thing in and of itself. You just have to be ready to say, nope, you're wrong. This is what the party is going to do. But you can't allow the mainstream media to purport this narrative that we are a fractured party, that we're going, you know, mm -hmm. that we're going to break apart, that we don't yeah. know what we stand for. Like, no. The mainstream media wants you to think that, and they're using yeah. these squish Republicans to to paint a false picture. No, that that's a great point, and you you know you you are quite insightful on a great many topics, but especially with the media, you you've got a really keen view, and it's true. I mean, as as much as I want to boot the Liz Cheney types out of GOP leadership, it is the case that the the media has an interest here in splitting up the Republican Party yeah. so that we don't win in twenty twenty two or twenty twenty four or or whenever. Now. Uh, I've got to get to a topic that, uh, look, you know, this is important, the parties and the elections, uh, power and whatever. The UFOs, Liz, I want to know. You disappeared at a very convenient time. Now you've just reappeared, you know, all of a sudden when all these little saucers and Tic Tacs and things are flying around. What do you know? You can't see my spaceship in this frame, right? I, I, I can see sort of the little that, that the green antennae coming up there behind no, your No, I pinned hair. that with a hair clip. I pinned it to my IFB. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> what do I think of it in all seriousness? I told yes. you. <laughs> is, it, told is it just you. an op? Is this like a fake? What I've is been it? texting all my friends in the DOD. I've been texting all my friends in the national security community. What do you know? Tell me your secrets. Um, and disappointingly, to their credit, they have not released much classified information to me. Much. My speculation, this is purely speculation because who's not interested in this, right? You see those right. videos and you're like, whoa, they're coming for us. My speculation is that it's probably not aliens. It's probably not. My speculation is that it's either military surveillance that we're not being told about. Because, you know, I mean, there are times that even training operations, you know, you turn on, you turn on your stealth type of settings and you show up differently on radar screens. That happens. There's also sometimes not physical objects that are used for surveillance. Like some of these things, it wouldn't surprise me if it's more like hologram type technology. Mm. That's what I actually think a lot of it is because that would allow it to move, you know, beyond the scope of our of our mm. technology, right? To defy gravity, to not have acceleration and braking periods, to be able to go up and down and side to side. That kind of stuff, um, almost like projections or holograms. I haven't heard a lot of people talking about that, but I'd be interested in the experts' mm. advice on that. What's well, And, you know, as outlandish as that might sound, if the alternative is little, <laughs> little green men coming from Venus, you know, then... Uh, that's not I, it outlandish. Sounds a little more, that's right. <laughs> that's right. I know, I, I agree. And there, there is also, y you always have Wait, to Wait, do wonder. you think it's aliens? I don't. I'm very anti. This is my least popular opinion. <laughs> I don't think that there is any reason to believe that any life exists whatsoever outside of the earth. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm not saying definitively it does. But I just, you always hear people, one, everyone wants there to be aliens because it's kind of fun and interesting. But two, you'll always hear people say, well, that Michael, the universe is so big. So it's just a matter of probability that there is life on other planets. And I think, well, you know, to ascertain a probability, you need to know literally anything about the subject, but about the subject of how <laughs> life is, we don't, we don't, we just don't know anything. We have no idea right. about the scientific uh, origins of life. So, you know, un until we know something about that, I, I can't venture a probability of, of if there's life on Pluto or something. No, I mean, as Catholics, it's compatible with Catholic theology, you know, with God, all things are possible. He created us. He could create other life, sure. But I agree that there's a difference between could be possible, certainly, versus <laughs> is, have evidence likely, that it yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, have as it, evidence that it is. And to my knowledge, there is no evidence, right? It's just people's speculation. No, and the Tic Tacs and the little, you know, Tic Tacs that tic -tacs. We'll, someday we'll find out is Xi Jinping. I'm just like, maybe, maybe your oxygen and... mask was on a little loose that day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. That's, I know. We'll see. Although all this denial sure sounds like something an alien would say. 
Oh. Mm-hmm. Well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll leave that for the audience to decide. Liz, I mean, I'm, it is a little bit like an alien, right? When you grow another human in your body. <laughs> <laughs> that is. And they, I don't know. I mean, I thankfully, you know, uh, my wife had a very tough time of it. She had a C-section. And, uh, but that all the more so, even the natural birth is sort of like that, you know, reaching out and the kind of like in the movies and everything. I don't know. Thankfully, I was behind the screen, so I didn't have to see it. I am... I am genuinely very, very excited about your show. I have, I'm not flattering. I'm not, you know, just saying this, you know, out of nowhere. I have missed you in the public discourse and I'm glad you're back. And I know the show is going to be a smash. It is the Liz Wheeler show. Where can people find it? Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate that. And you do actually have to say that because you know that I'll text you to ask you obsessively about the episodes if you <laughs> that's, don't. That's right. People Hold can on. go to Liz, LizWheelerShow.com. Uh, please subscribe. Please give me five-star reviews. Uh, please actually write a review because in order to climb up the charts and beat Michael on iTunes, we need those five-star ratings. We need those reviews. We need those subscriptions. And we're having a ton of fun. So go to LizWheelerShow.com. And if they, let's say someone just, you know, they don't, they don't do URLs. What is this, the 90s? People go have a browser. So they're on, they can get it just on Apple Podcasts. Just search Liz Wheeler Show. Yeah, definitely. And that's what LizWheelerShow.com takes you to all the different podcast platforms. But you can go to anywhere that you get your Spotify. pods and you'll find it. Yep, Spotify. Is it on, is it on, it's on YouTube. Yep, it's on for YouTube. Now. It's on Spotify. <laughs> yeah, they haven't kicked oh, you yeah, off yet. For now. Yeah. On Apple Podcasts. Uh, any, anywhere that you listen to podcasts, we will be there. It's on Rumble. It's on YouTube. Right, Rumble. These are like, they're all these new things. I don't know. It's on MySpace. It's on LiveJournal. It's on Zanga. It's on Instant Messenger. It's on a lot of places. Liz, uh, before we go, by the way, everybody, go subscribe. Go check out the show. Leave a five-star review. And uh, and then if it turns out that Liz is an alien, we're going to, we'll have to recalibrate, okay? We'll have to, re- but we're, you're going to be talking about lots of aliens, a- aliens from outer space. You'll be talking about aliens from Guatemala and Nicaragua and issues at the southern border. You'll be talking about all all manner of public policy issues on the show. Everything. So Everything. Thank Liz you. Wheeler Show. Liz, so good to be with you. See you soon. Thank you, Michael. 